welcome everyone. This is an advanced work uh, methodology workshop as part of the Cognitive, Computational, and Systems Neuroscience Pathway. This workshop series is focused on conducting high quality research. And like other aspects of CCSN, the content is meant to be relevant to graduate students and trainees in psychological and brain sciences, biomedical engineering, and systems neuroscience. But of course, the content's highly generalizable. So today we are kicking off the first of this academic year's uh, uh, discussion. The format for today, we'll have about an hour or up to an hour of presentation. And then at the end, uh, we will take questions where we prioritize the graduate students. Uh, so you'll have the opportunity to ask your questions first, then we'll take questions from the other attendees. Uh, please feel free to post your questions in the chat as they arise. Uh, myself, as well as Dennis Barber, who's on the call, uh, we will sort of collect the questions and we can ask them at the end. And we can also open up the floor at the end as well. So I'm really excited today. We have Dr. Kevin Mitchell talking to us about defense against the dark arts or how not to fool yourself with statistics. Uh, Dr. Mitchell is a professor of genetics and neuroscience at Trinity College Dublin. We are especially grateful that he is here so late in the evening. Uh, his interests include genetics of brain wiring, how this maps onto cognition, psychiatric disease, and other perceptual conditions. He's the author of the book Innate and has a new book coming out called Free Agents. Um, I learned about him from following his blog and posts on the website formerly known as Twitter. Uh, I am really excited for him to be here. Uh, and given the title of this talk, I'm gonna cross my fingers. There, there are some more Harry Potter references coming. Uh, so with that, I will introduce Dr. Mitchell. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley, very much. And uh, thanks to you and Dennis for the invitation. Um, it's great to be able to talk to you all. I actually spent a, a very enjoyable summer in Wash U a long time ago in a lab when I was an undergrad and um, really enjoyed it just in the in the biological department of biology, but um, with a lot of uh, contact with the, the, the med school over there. So it was great. So um, yeah, very pleased to be able to talk to you about this. I'm going to disappoint you, Shelley, because I don't think there are many <laughs> Harry Potter references unless <laughs> I can think of them on the phone, but now you've, now you've put it up to me. So, okay. So yeah, this is this is um, I guess a talk about realization that I've come to over my career, and there's nothing special to me. Is that many fields have come to that um, that the way we're using statistics has maybe not been the right way. And so this is a quote from Richard Feynman, who was saying that the first principle in science generally is that you must not fool yourself. And it's important to realize that you are the easiest person to fool. And I think um, that's a wise kind of quote to keep in mind. And we might like to think that, you know, the ideal scientist is like Agent uh, Scully here, who uh, is very skeptical and, and rigorous and demands high standards of evidence. But actually a lot of science is more like Fox Mulder here, who wants to believe. Right? And that's the problem, is that a lot of the incentives that we have in place um, just psychologically predispose us to wanting to believe, you know, statistically significant findings when they pop up and, and wanting to, to think that we've discovered something um, and so on. So there's a nice um, insight here from Charles Darwin, actually, who was before... Before this was called confirmation bias, he was writing about it, and he says he followed a, a golden rule. So whenever a published fact or new observation or a thought came across me, which was opposed to my general results, I would make a note of it without fail and at once. I had found by experience that such facts and thoughts were far more apt to escape from my memory than favorable ones. So a classic sort of articulation of confirmation bias that not only do we tend to believe uh, the, the facts that, that fit with our hypotheses, but we tend to notice and remember them as well. We just literally just don't notice the ones that don't um, align with what we're thinking or what we're hoping to see. So of course, um, a lot of statistics is designed to help us with that, right? It's supposed to be an objective tool to help us um, test our hypotheses 
and try and figure out really what we should pay attention to. And Ron, Ronald Fisher um, and, and others designed things like hypothesis testing and statistical significance uh, metrics as tools to help people know what they should pay attention to. What, what should they be surprised by in their data, given the amount of variation that exists in the, in the population that they were sampling from or other kinds of background factors. He never intended this to be as some sort of strict cutoff that just you know divided things into true and not true, which I think is unfortunately what has happened in a lot of science is that we just take things like p-values as determinants of truth and um, as opposed to indicators of something that we should pay more attention to. So um, we'll see uh, that many fields have sort of fallen into that trap. Not all fields, of course, because many fields of science don't need statistics. This is a quote from Ernest, Ernest Rutherford, which is fairly dismissive of um, you know, experiments that do need statistics, but that's not really fair because of course, many fields where you can, you know, you can do controlled experiments, that's great. Um, and you can have a very clean, clear test of your hypothesis just from your results that doesn't require any further analysis. But of course, fields that um, are dealing with complex scenarios that are uncontrolled do require statistics, but we have to do them carefully. Um, a lot of the sort of angst and um, introspection about our research approaches started, I think, for me anyway, with this paper uh, very famously published by John Ioannidis in 2005 called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. And it really deals with fields that are um, doing statistical tests on, on data and looking for some kind of an effect somewhere. Um, usually the, what, what he found was that um, the research findings were less likely to be true, that is robust and replicable, if the uh, studies were smaller in a field, if the effect sizes were smaller, it, especially if there were a lot of um, tested relationships that weren't defined in advance. So there were a lot of researcher degrees of freedom and, and a lot of flexibility in designs and definitions and outcomes and so on. So all of that really amounts to fishing for significance, not actually testing, a, setting up a hypothesis and testing it clearly, um, you know, where it's predefined and nicely controlled, but really looking for something somewhere in ways that pretty much guarantee that you will find something. So, um, yeah, fields where there's it, it's impossible to do tightly controlled experiments. Usually, anything to do with humans is is that is included in there, where the outcomes have multifarious causes. So there's a lot going on, and you're trying to figure out one of many causes. But there's lots of background. There's lots of other sources of variance that have to be um, sort of statistically averaged over, at best, or controlled for in some kind of a way. And especially if the effects are small, then uh, they're very prone to noise. The, the last point here where the, you know, the referring to fields where the incentives are skewed, I think all, all of science has some skewed incentives in that we have pressure to publish, we have pressure to publish more exciting findings um, and sort of sexier, more sensational findings and so on. Um, but I will say that some of the fields have some extra incentives that are... Um, a little more problematic in terms of conflicts of interest where they're closer to the clinic, for example, and there's a potential commercial application or um, some other sort of glory to be had where uh, you know those, those kinds of incentives do feed into the sort of ways in which people report their data, unfortunately. It'd be nice if that weren't true, but it is true. Okay, this is a, this is a fantastic, um, paper by Dorothy Bishop, who's been one of the real leaders, I think, in thinking about reproducibility. And she called it the four horsemen of irreproducibility, which are harking, which is hypothesizing after the research, after the results are known, uh, low power, p-hacking, and publication bias. And we'll talk about all of these as we go through. I want to actually start with the last one, publication bias, because it's by far the most insidious one and it's the hardest sort of to, to realize and it hides all of the other ones right so all those other sins uh, are hidden by uh, us only seeing some of the research that was actually done this is not 
a new problem. This is a this is a paper from 1959, which is is clearly highlighting the problems that arise when fields are just looking for um, you know some kind of statistical significance and they're not publishing the non-significant results. And that leads to, first of all, as the per person says here, other investigators repeating these things independently. Um, and it leads to uh, a skewed evidence base because you're only hearing about the ones that turned out to be positive. So it leads to very untrustworthy fields of research collectively, not just for individual studies, but across a whole field. And you can see that kind of thing. This is a, um, I forget the reference for it, unfortunately. This is a plot of Z values extracted from confidence intervals in, in Medline for um, you know, 40 years. And what you can see here is that there's this massive sort of dearth of them in, in this valley here where they're not very significantly different. You know, they're not, um, they're, they're within two standard deviations of the mean in either the positive or negative direction of whatever they're measuring. And then this sudden huge peak just on the side of statistical significance, which is a, a highly, highly unlikely um, scenario to get just by chance. You would imagine a much smoother distribution in reality. So publication bias is very strong, very pervasive. And like I said, it hides a lot of ills. Okay, I'm gonna talk about um, lessons from three fields that, that I have some personal uh, experience with and their um, psychology, especially social psychology and human genetics and neuroimaging. And I say painful, I mean, they really have been painful, um, but there's been a lot of growth, I think, in all of those fields over recent years. There's some other fields that have yet to get the memo, um, but I think the, these fields are actually leading the way in, in identifying these problems and then identifying what to do about them. So the, the poster child, I guess, for the replication crisis generally has been social psychology. Um, it's, it's been a very prominent public sort of debate going on about it. Um, here's a, a really nice paper actually, which sums up a lot of the field of, in particular, social priming. So social priming includes, um, well, this, tons and tons of studies where people are exposed to some kind of cue um, un unbeknownst to themselves and then tested on some kind of a behavior and is found to show um, an effect on their behavior. So it's a, you know, the, the take home message was that a lot of our behavior is controlled or determined by subconscious influences from the outside that can really push, push us around. It has uh, interesting um, implications for questions like free will, for example. But um, many of those studies just are horribly, horribly unreliable. They're, um, they became huge. Uh, there's a whole industries built around them of, of sort of um, uh, decision-making, economics and, and psychology and so on. Um, this is a famous book by John Bard, one of the leaders of this field who was looking at these supposedly robust subliminal effects on behavior. I'll give you just one example. Uh, the famous, probably most famous one where he had undergraduates in Stanford reading some lists of words, um, doing some kind of task. The task was nothing relevant to the actual experiment. And then when they left the room, he recorded them and measured how quickly they walked down the corridor away from the experiment. and some of the students had been exposed to lists of words that referred to old people or old age or some kind of infirmity or something like that. And the others had not. And the result was that the ones who had read these words walked more slowly afterwards down the hallway. Um, now, there's tons of other sort of similar ones like that. I've never really been very convinced by them um, or even if they, even if the statistics themselves had turned out to be true, the uh, idea that these would generalize to real behavior in the world was never particularly convincing either. But um, like I said, a lot was made of them. Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning economist um, and psychologist wrote this really ex excellent book actually called Thinking Fast and Slow. But uh, unfortunately, some portion of that book is based on these ideas from this uh, field of social priming. And he was very, very strong in his wording about these things because he looked at the statistics, he looked at the way they were done, they looked very you know, significant. And he said, disbelief is not an option. You can't just not believe these things. 
Uh, the results are not made up. They're not statistical flukes. And you have no choice but to accept that the conclusions of these studies are true. I think that's an incredibly strongly worded um, assertion that these, these studies are true. And he also asserted that they were, you know, sort of more generally important. Now, it turns out that it has emerged that actually many of the results were made up, like literally just completely made up. And, and especially ironically, um, by some researchers studying things like morality and honesty. Um, and I won't go into any more details because some of them are a bit litigious. Uh, but the yeah, it, it turns out some of them were just fraudulent. And many of the rest of them do appear to have been statistical flukes because they were plagued by a lot of um, problems that emerged as people tried to replicate these experiments and they just uh, failed to do so. So typically what was observed was that the originally published studies had large uh, effect sizes and they were all positive. And then over time, as people started to try to replicate them, the effect sizes went down, down, down until they were overlapping zero. And what you can see here is that the unpublished experiments provided by authors of the original studies were massively, massively in the insignificant range. So there was a clear publication bias as well as um, probably a publication bias here and the effect of just small samples and, and noise. And this is a very typical well-known effect in epidemiology where people will, it's called the, the winner's curse, where the first published studies on some thing um, usually have very big effect sizes. And they tend to be, uh, they tend to go away or get smaller and smaller and smaller as you do bigger and bigger studies. Um, and that really is a reflection of publication bias, I think. Uh, it, it, this uh, has been analyzed um, in, in great detail, I think, both in terms of the scientific methodology, the statistical methodology, but also the, um, the sociology of the field and how it reacted to these things and the kinds of practices that are observed in this field versus other ones. This is a really, really well written um, study uh, or write up of these of these studies. And it makes the important point that even though Danny Kahneman um, you know, was such a champion of these kinds of studies, he should have known better because he, he himself has written about confirmation bias and all other kinds of biases. And he himself has written about the exaggerated confidence in the validity of conclusions based on small samples. But those, you know, famous studies like Barg's priming study used only 30 undergraduate students to demonstrate that effect. So I think we're all sort of learning that that's not a good way to do things, that we need to have bigger samples, we need to have better controls, and we need to replicate these kinds of um, findings if they're to be believed. Uh, a shock, I think, for the field came when um, Daryl Bem published this study, now very infamous, I think, uh, but published in a, you know, the, one of the top, top journals in the field, which was basically claiming um, extrasensory perception. And I'll leave you to, to look it up if you're interested in the details, but it was a perfectly normal methodology that he used that gave what looked like a perfectly good statistically significant p-value for this kind of effect. And of course, um, you know, it didn't, didn't hold up. It's not real. We can't do ESP. Um, but it, it, the fact that those methods could, could give that uh, kind of result for what was obviously not a real result, um, I think shook the field quite a bit and was part of what prompted, I think, this introspection in the field, which has been very welcome. And I think the you know social psychology and psychology in general have really changed the way that they um, operate to, to greater or lesser extent, let's say. Why did they have those problems? Well, um, there's a, a list of what are sort of collectively known as questionable research practices. Generally, there are the power the the studies are underpowered. So if you've got sort of statistically noisy data and you've got small samples, well, sometimes you'll just get a blip more often than not. Right? It's like looking at somebody batting average over ten games instead of one hundred and sixty-two games. Someone's going to be batting four hundred. Right? Uh, failing to correct for multiple tests. We'll go into this a little bit more. Um, if you do statistics and you do lots of tests, then you're just more likely that one of them will turn up, you know, less than one in 20 by chance. Um, excessive researcher degrees of freedom. So there's a variety of these 
things where you can sort of manipulate the way you do your analyses. You can choose slightly different things as you go along where it looks like, oh, maybe this is near significance. Well, maybe I'll add a few more data points. Maybe I'll take out an outlier. Maybe I'll change some parameter. Maybe I'll change the cluster size in my fMRI experiment, whatever it is. All these things, they're easy to do. It's very tempting uh, to, to, to play with the data like that. And of course, the more you do that, the more you're effectively guaranteeing that you'll get something significant somewhere. I think covariate mining is another one where, you know, if you don't get a main effect, well, you can maybe split by sex or split by age or something else. And, you know, you get smaller and smaller subsamples, one of which is likely to show up positive if you, if you keep doing this. Um, I, and I may, I think, show a couple of examples of that. Hypothesizing after the results are known is, is sort of uh, like p-hacking in the sense that you can use the hypothesis, you can, you can form your hypothesis once you have some indication of what the data are showing and then test the hypothesis on the same data, which is obviously circular. Um, the biggest one, you know, for me is just lack of replication in independent samples. It, it's taking the idea of a p-value in, in some one sample as being true, as opposed to being an, in, uh, an indication that maybe it's worth some further research. Um, and, and some fields, you know, never had that sort of idea of building replication into a study right from the get go, while it's perfectly the norm in many other fields. And then of course, publication bias is, is rampant. Um, this is a, I hesitated to put this in because it's very um, sarcastic. But it's it's uh, it's kind of a cathartic read if you like this kind of thing um, called the noise miners by John Schmidt and the idea is that you can take noise um, just data that have lots of parameters in there and you can shuck that and polish it up and combine noise in different ways and make a fact and then you get a publication and yay and then the 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 press will um, you know often find that and 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 unfortunately a lot of the worst studies the least reliable studies are the ones that make it into the newspapers and make it into public consciousness as well partly because they're um they're, they tend to be standalone studies right like a, a social priming study or like a an, um, a neuroimaging study they're easy to explain to people um or like a genetic association between some gene and some trait or something like that they can be kind of simplified and presented in that way um even if they're they tend to be wrong Correcting for multiple tests. Okay, the the I never knew about this when I was uh, trained as a as a student, and it took me a while to wrap my head around it. But once I did, it, it's pretty obvious, really. So if you play the lottery, you should be pleasantly surprised if you win, right? That would be highly unlikely, but you should be less surprised if somebody wins. So if loads and loads and loads of people are playing the lottery, someone's going to win, right? So it's not surprising that uh, in a similar vein, if you do loads and loads of tests. So you do 20 tests and you're looking for one of them to be significant at a one in 20 chance, P less than 0 0.05. Well, you shouldn't be surprised if one of your tests turns out like that, right? So you have to correct for the fact that you've done 20 tests or however, however many it is. And if you don't, you're just going to, um, you're just going to polish up some noise. Uh, let me go through a few, a few particular examples. So I'll start with, with human genetics where, um, this has been rampant, but it's been solved, I think, or at least <laughs> I thought it had been solved until I searched PubMed about half an hour ago. Um, but anyway, so what we start with in, in human genetics is usually a robust phenomenon. We have a demonstration of heritability of some trait or some disorder that leads to the hypothesis that somewhere in the genome, there are some genetic variants that are associated with whatever the trait is whatever the condition is. So um, a popular way to test this in the sort of early 2000s was to take a candidate gene association analysis. The idea was, for example, that say, you know, schizophrenia um, it involves dopaminergic disruption somehow, at least the pharmacology suggests that it does. And uh, therefore, let's look at dopamine pathway genes and see if there's an association with schizophrenia. And so there's multiple genes that people could pick. Each of them could have multiple single nucleotide polymorphisms within them. That's a site in the genome where maybe some people have an A, like 70% of people have an A, 30% have a G or something like that. 
And then you can just test for differences in frequency of those, the two versions between cases and controls. So it's a straight up epidemiology study. You're just looking for greater exposure to risk variant in cases versus controls. Usually it was, you know, a couple hundred, maybe a few hundred cases and controls. And what people will do is report any positive findings, but usually not report negative findings. Now, the, the problem with this is um, that you're, you're doing loads of multiple tests of all these different SNPs uh, in small samples and only reporting the positive ones. And so what happened was that the literature just got polluted with these reports of uh, positive findings, some with huge effect sizes that turned out to be completely wrong. And there's a huge, huge literature looking at a few um, common variants in particular genes. This is one encoding the serotonin transporter. Um, this is one, you know, dopamine transporter, dopamine receptors, and so on. So there's this massive field where um, you can find hundreds and hundreds of publications. In fact, I just checked 2,200 publications on the 5-HTT polymorphism, including many just published in the last week. Um, where people were doing statistical associations with all kinds of things, right? All kinds of behavioral measures, personality traits, um, and, and a particularly all sorts of brain phenotypes. And sometimes you could add in covariates, like you could look for interactions with environmental factors, for example. And there were hundreds of positive findings reported. And this is a pretty strong statement, but effectively none of them replicate. That whole literature is, uh, is a lost cause, unfortunately. Um, this is a, a really well-written review of the literature on this particular one, the serotonin transporter. It was of interest because the serotonin transporter is the target of many antidepressant uh, medications. So uh, SSRIs block the serotonin transporter. So it was of interest in terms of anxiety and depression and even traits like neuroticism and anxiety and so on. And uh, there are hundreds of reports of those kinds of associations. There were all sorts of reports of you know, people's amygdala being more or less sensitive and, and things like that, where, um, yeah, none of them turn out to be robust. This is a this is a different gene that's called the MAOA gene. It's an enzyme involved in serotonin synthesis. Um, it may be known to you as the warrior gene because there's a mutation, a rare mutation in this gene in a particular family in Holland where um, the people with that rare mutation are prone to very, very antisocial violence and arson and rape and all sorts of horrendous um, crimes. So really, really big genetic effect of rare mutations in this gene. However, the, the research I'm talking about here is a common variant. There's sort of two forms, and it's been associated with all kinds of things in the literature. Again, they don't really replicate. This is a very famous one, which was an interaction in this case with childhood maltreatment. So what we're seeing here is uh, people divided into ones who have the so-called low activity and the high activity version, these common variants of this gene, and whether they, this is a score of antisocial behavior in a sample of about um, overall about a thousand people, actually they hear only about um, 400 some. And um, what they found was there really wasn't a difference between their antisocial behavior scores if they had not been exposed to childhood maltreatment, um, or even if they were probably exposed to childhood maltreatment, but only in cases that were severely exposed. And this became a very celebrated result because it was this interesting sort of interaction between your genes and your environment. It was nature and nurture in combination and seemed to make sense. Um, and that idea probably does make sense. So unfortunately, these data don't hold up. So it's another one that um, really just doesn't um, stand the test of time. And you know what you can see here is that they, by splitting with these different covariates here, they reduce their sample size. You know, smaller and smaller. They're down, they're down to fifty people here, or even less in these categories. So what did the field do? Well, the field recognized eventually that these candidate gene studies were just producing noise because what happened is eventually people started to report the negative ones because there was the field already, uh, the literature already there claiming these positive things. So the negative ones were reportable. Um, they realized this wouldn't stand. And so what they tried to do, and this required some technological development as well, was rather than testing one gene at a time and, and only reporting you know, the, the, um, the particular SNPs that came up positive and not correcting for multiple tests and not replicating, 
Instead, they, the human genetics field came together to make these enormous consortia that do these genome-wide association studies. So the idea is the same, same basic epidemiology, except they're testing 500,000 or a million of these variants across the whole genome all at once. And of course, you need huge, huge samples in order to do that. And, um, and you need to very, very tightly control a lot of the things that you do and, and replicate and correct for all of those multiple tests. So what these um, genome-wide association analyses do is test everything, right? So they're not biased or selective in any way. They test in very, very large samples with replication samples. And they have this line here, which is the, the, the bar for statistical significance. So this is called a Manhattan plot, if, for those of you who haven't seen one before. And what it is doing, each of these little dots, is one of these single nucleotide polymorphisms going from chromosome one along the genome all the way to the end. And um, the ones above this line of statistical significance, which is five by 10 to the minus eight, uh, are genome-wide significant. Now, people don't just believe them because of that. They're also replicated in another, in another sample, completely independent sample. So it's a good indication that there's something good going on, but it's not the whole story. The good thing is that everything down here is also reported. We're not just hearing about the positive things, we hear everything, right? All of those negative results are also presented. Um, so they're massively powered, but they they're, they have to be massively powered because of all these multiple tests. So you need huge, huge samples. And that required uh, a complete sea change in the way that human geneticists actually worked. They had to go from doing individual studies with a few hundred people in their own labs to forming these consortia that would do studies with, you know, tens of thousands of people um, or hundreds of thousands of people, even millions at this stage. And all of that was required to get anything that was meaningful. And let me just give you one example that's a follow-up on some of the stuff I was talking about with the candidate gene. So this is a GWAS of neuroticism, the personality um, statistical construct. And you can see there's a bunch of, of positive um, SNPs here above the line. And in fact, there were 136 loci here that implicated maybe 600 genes, because it's, it's not always obvious which, which gene is being affected by a variant. And just as a sort of reality check, when people look at the genes that were found there in terms of their expression um, levels in different tissues, then they were found, they were highly enriched for expression in the brain, but not in other tissues. So that was good. That gives you some indication or some comfort that these are real results. And when they looked at the biochemical functions or cellular functions of the implicated genes, they found lots and lots of uh, functions involved in neural development. And this is true for all kinds of behavioral traits generally, is that they reflect some differences in the way the brain develops. What they didn't find was anything in the serotonin pathway, you know, these, these candidate genes that had been published before. So it, it's not just, it's not just that um, they don't hold up on their own. It's that these massive experiments refute them, right? They're actively refuted by these, uh, by these bigger studies. Okay, um, let's move on. So, so human genetics, I think, has in a sense gotten its act together, um, but it required this massive change in the sociological enterprise um, and, and um, all the methods required to do that. Let's look at, at neuroscience. So this is a really um, useful paper, overview paper that refers to, excuse me, many different areas of, of neuroscience. Um, these sorts of problems of small studies with low power are endemic really across many different areas. Uh, I think, you know, mouse behavior, for example, uh, many, many studies are done with very, very small samples, far too low. And, you know, you can calculate the power that you need you can say, what's the effect size I expect? How many, what's the variation that I expect to see? How many animals do I need to robustly be able to detect an effect size of this amount if, um, you know, if it exists? And it's possible to do those if you have some kind of exploratory data on the variance and this, the expected effect size, but most people don't, um, don't do that. Let me give you one example. This is from an area that, um, just gets right up my nose, frankly. Uh, it's about uh, trans transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. It's another one of these things that many people will have found, uh, heard of, because it makes its way into the popular press. 
Um, the the stuff in humans is really bad. I'm just going to show you the stuff in in mice here, or one experiment here. Um, if you want to hear about the human stuff, I'll be happy to rant about it in the question session. But this is a this is a study um, that claimed that there was early stress behavior here that was transmitted over multiple generations and affected behavior in the offspring here in in you know differentially in males versus females and so on. Um, it's a sort of a classic case of doing loads and loads of tests, not having predefined hypotheses of what to expect, mining lots of covariates in terms of, of sex, and then making a story about it afterwards, frankly. So um, let me just show you what the data actually look like. So here's the F1, that's the first generation after um, the, the exposure here, and the males were taken, and everything goes from there. So those males show an effect of being removed from their from their mothers or, the, or their mother being stressed, um, actually. And what you can see in this forced swim test is that in the next generation, the females showed an effect in this test, but the males did not. And then in the generation after that, bizarrely, it switches back. The males now show an effect and the females don't. And yet in this test here, you know, the males show an effect here in the first generation, and then there's no effect uh, otherwise. So these results are not corrected for multiple tests, and they don't survive correction for multiple tests, which means that we should treat them as norms, but they're not treated in, in that way. And the, you know, the fact that they kind of skip generations and cross sexes and everything was presented as an interesting finding, a post hoc, when in fact, it, you know, to, to me or any reasonable person looking at that would just reinforce the notion or the impression that it's just norms. But um, yeah, this and, and that you know paper is very very highly cited and just taken as evidence that this phenomenon exists in in mice. All right, let's look at, at some human um, science. So neuroimaging uh, has been in the headlines, I think, in the last little while, especially since this paper came out last year, where it was looking at a particular type of neuroimaging study. And I want to make clear that this does not apply to lots of you know, cognitive science and neuroimaging where people are doing, you know, a particular task and there there's repeated trials for the same person over and over again. Um, and you're working out, you know, which parts of the brain are involved in, in different things. This is a different kind of analysis, which these authors call a brain-wide association study in, in a, a, analogy to genome-wide association studies, where they're basically taking, you know, two groups of people and they're looking for a difference in their brains anywhere. Right? They don't really have a, a hypothesis a priori. They're just looking for something to be different somewhere. And this is, is in terms of structural imaging. Of course, you can do it for, you know, DTI connectivity. You can do it for resting state connectivity. You can do it for fMRI things, whatever you want. And um, what they found was that actually you need sample sizes on the order of around 2,000, not the typical ones, which are, you know, a really good study would have been 200 but 10 times that to be robust, it, to robustly detect an effect size within this sort of confidence limit. And I think that was a shock to the field. And I think this paper, which just came out uh, a few weeks ago, will be an even bigger shock because what it is saying is that the analysis that was done in the previous paper I just mentioned actually had some flaws to it in the sense of, of resampling from the same data set. And if you don't do that, then it's much worse in fact, you would need, it's about 10 times worse than that previous paper said. So the samples would be about 20,000, not 2,000 that, that you would need to robustly detect these kinds of um, effects of the size that we expect, given all the individual differences that are there and, and underlying variation. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's quite a shocker for um, people in, in uh, neuroimaging. And I think, you can combine these sorts of areas of neuroimaging and genomics and get the worst of both worlds in the sense that you now have is you have a huge search space in genomics you have a huge search space in uh, you know in your mri um, parameters and then you multiply them together so it's literally exponentially huger um, search space and um, this is a an editorial i wrote when i was section editor for the european journal of neuroscience and to be honest, I wrote it out of exasperation because I I was finding that my only job was to desk reject bad papers that were just clearly noise and the, the memo had really just not gotten out. Um, I don't know if it has still, but 
um, anyway, you're, you're, you're asking for trouble if you're just relying on stats of a single experiment here, as opposed to taking them. I mean, I have no problem with doing an exploratory study and then going to a replication sample. That's great. That's what we should do. Um, okay, so generally speaking, a lot of these things, either there's just a massive search space that isn't being corrected for, or even worse is that there's many ways to analyze the same data. And first of all, you can just do active p-hacking, as I kind of alluded to earlier, where you're tweaking your analysis as you go along, um, because you're you're looking at your data, or you're hoping, you know, you know, you could take an outlier out and it would push it to significance. I mean, that's that's really sort of actively bad, and it's obviously bad. Less obviously bad is where your analysis has some flexibility to it that you haven't decided beforehand and you would, you let it be informed by the data. So for example, you, you look at your fMRI data and you look at the size of clusters and you see it looks like, well, maybe there's a difference when the cluster is this size. Okay, that's the size that I'm gonna to use to do my analysis. So that's obviously a problem because you're really retesting the hypothesis on the same data that's suggested. And that's, that's bad. Um, Another one, which is really uh, more about the field than about individual studies, is that there's just lots of variability in how people choose to analyze data. And it could be chosen completely fairly and honestly by any individual um, lab doing a study, but there are other ways that it could be done. And that leads to um, this problem, especially when you have publication bias, where you're just not getting even kind of sampling. So this this idea of um, too too much too many research degrees of freedom came to a head. I think um, this was the this was the equivalent to the ESP paper in neuroimaging. A, a big shock to people when a, a dead salmon was found to have you know particular um, activation in its brain that was significantly different in response to I forget that they were exposing the the dead salmon to something actually in the in the scanner. I forget what it was. Um, so it's funny, right? But it's not also not funny because it really does highlight that there's just far too much flexibility in research pipelines. Um, this this testing hypothesis on the same data that suggested it is pretty common, in, and it's very sort of uh, not obvious, right? It's quite insidious. It's not obvious that you're doing it. You really have to not peak. You really have to have your data pipeline clear before you start doing the um, data collection. And that's not always possible. And in fact, again, there's nothing wrong with doing some, a pilot study and then saying, these are the parameters that I should use for my real study. Just don't do your stats on the pilot study because you're, you're cheating, right? I mean, it's, it's circular. You're guaranteed to get something significant if you design your stats to test it there. Um, this, the, the variation in analysis pipelines is interesting. There's three papers here, one from, um, and this is from 2019. This is looking at fMRI data, and I'll show you more about that in a minute. These are two that came out within the last week, I think. One of which is in looking at ecological um, studies, same idea, the same data is given to loads of different people, um, and they're just told to look for something. They're not told how to do it. Um, they get wildly different um, effect sizes and significance and so on. Um, and then this one is for some sociological data, which was the same same sort of outcome. This is what the data from the neuroscience, the neuroimaging looks like. So there were 70 teams given uh, some fMRI data. There were nine hypotheses that were pre-set that they were to test. And what you could see here is the consistency in the outcome. So three of them, three of the hypotheses, all of the teams basically found no effect. Um, one of them, they all found a big effect. And then these ones, five of them, like 20 to 30% of them found a significant effect. And then 70 to 80% of them didn't find a significant effect. So huge sort of um, variation in the in the outcomes. And it's not obvious what to do about that. You know, it's not, it's not really clear um, how to analyze that. This is another study looking at um, exclusion criteria for people who were in uh, fear conditioning research. And they're given some you know, conditioned stimulus or an unconditioned stimulus, tested on various trials, and sometimes they just don't respond or they don't respond appropriately, whatever. And then some of those, some of those trials or some of the participants are excluded, but the criteria on which they're excluded vary hugely across these different um, researchers. And you end up with just a massive sort of expansion of, of parameters that means you explode the possibility space 
for finding something significant or, or altering the analysis, the, the outcome of analysis. So a big, big problem. One interesting way out of this that I don't think has gotten a lot of uptake, but it could do, is called multiverse analysis. So the idea here, and this is as reported by Simonson and Al, is that you could have a huge, huge set of all the possible specifications of parameters of your model or your analysis pipeline or your selection criteria and so on. Some subset of those could be valid by whatever criteria the, the, the field deems appropriate. Um, some subset of those could be not redundant with each other. And then you might have one researcher who, who thinks, okay, well, these, this is the approach I'm gonna take. Here's the, the little part of this universe where their analysis lives. Now, you could have two, two researchers who have similar views about the right way to analyze these data, the right things to care about in this kind of experiment, and they might live in broadly the same area, but they still might have quite different um, sort of subsets within here. And then you could also have this scenario where you've got you know, people who different ideas about what's valid, and they're completely different. They're in different sub parts of the universe here um, in terms of data analysis. So one way around that is just to recognize that this is true and actually do all of the analysis, do all of them, and then report how many of them um, turn out to be um, significant. And that's called this multiverse analysis. Um, so you calculate over all your reasonable specifications, and then you say, look, 70% of them gave a significant result or 20% or whatever it is. It's kind of like the way they do weather forecasts, actually, where they add some noise to it. Uh, to their parameters, they run the model over and over again, and they tell you when it's you know seventy percent chance of rain means seventy percent of the models predicted rain um, in this in this result. Like I said, it doesn't um, doesn't happen very often, I think yet, but it seems to make sense to me. Where the data set is really complex, and there's just tons of combinatorial explosion of of possible um, analysis pipelines. Um, okay, improving reproducibility. So those are the problems, uh, what to do about it. Generally, first of all, accept the required sample sizes. You know, I think many fields have done that. Human genetics has done that. Although, like I said, <laughs> there's still candidate gene association studies being published, even though everyone is supposed to know that they're completely untrustworthy. Um, but we should just not do underpowered studies. And I'm, I mean, I'm saying it like this because I've heard people argue back saying, look, we realize that you need bigger studies, but how am I supposed to do this with my lab? You know, my lab has limited resources and limited time. Um, and, you know, I need my undergrads or my grad students to, to have something to do. And I just don't buy it. I just don't accept that argument. It's just wasting everybody's time, wasting all the money uh, to do these. They just produce noise. It's worse than doing nothing in my mind to do underpowered studies. Um, although it requires big, big changes sometimes to do bigger ones. Um, reducing or at least or being aware of your you know, degrees of freedom, having some pipelines that you're um, defining ahead of time or using a pilot study, as I said, correcting for multiple tests, reporting all the results, those are all really important. And one really good way to do that is with pre-registration. And I think this is kind of becoming a gold standard and more and more journals are accepting these kinds of, of pre-registered studies or even demanding them. So the idea here is, to predefine some hypotheses, to do your power analyses and say, okay, I need a thousand people or 2000 people or whatever it is um, to test this properly. And then to submit the research design for peer review to the journal. And the journal, if the peer reviewers come back and say, yep, this research design should test that hypothesis rigorously and it's interesting, um, then the journal sort of agrees to publish the results, whether they're negative or positive. So you're getting around the publication bias, you're changing the incentives. The incentive is now not to find something, it's to do credible research where even a negative finding is a finding, right? You can trust the negative finding as well as the positive ones. And usually they have some you know, replication of exploratory results. They allow uh, you know, some post hoc analyses, you just have to distinguish them when you're reporting. And, and I think this is a really positive um, sort of move and I, I hope to see them taken up a lot more. Go big or stay home, um, you may need very large consortia, like in, in human genetics. I think neuroimaging you know, is moving that way. You may need very, very large samples and that requires changes to a lot of things. First of all, it requires standardized sample collection and, and phenotyping. You, know, you, need your, um, you need the same um, pipelines in your imaging or, or whatever it is. 
um, same platforms and so on. But it also requires this sociological change in the incentives, the recognition, the reward that people get for being, you know, one middle author uh, in a paper with 250 authors on it. It's a very, very big change um, to the way that we work and recognize people's contributions, I think. And yeah, replicate, replicate, replicate. I mean, why not? I just don't believe anything at all the first time I see it. I can, you can have the lowest p-value you like. Show me a replication. I'm not going to believe it. There's just too many ways to get, um, you know, spurious, spurious findings. And I would add, um, you know, triangulate. Don't just do one method over again. Do a different method that will confirm the results or support the results or at least build up a, a, a sort of a picture of a, a framework that hangs together um, rather than these independent little observations, which, are, you know, like I said, those are the ones, these independent observations are the ones that make it into the newspapers and make it into the public consciousness, unfortunately. So generally, how not to fool yourself? First of all, just don't blindly trust p-values or similar stats. They're just tools. That's what they were designed for. They really don't prove anything. They don't reveal truth. They shouldn't be seen that way. They're just a guide. Um, for further research. Uh, okay, one final point, just because it's it's a popular these days to think that maybe machine learning will come to the rescue because it's great at handling all these data and finding associations um, that are interesting, right? And of course, it is great at finding associations, so great that it will definitely find associations in your data because machine learning overfits noise. That's really what it's super, super good at unless you um, have very, very kind of sophisticated thing. So I think when people reach for machine learning um, as, a, as a solution here, they're making the problem much, much worse if you do it in a naive kind of a way, because machine learning will definitely give you some significant um, outcomes. These are two super um, books. One is a, you know quite old by, by uh, Ben Goldacre called Bad Science. Uh, still really, really good. It was the first book I read that got me thinking about these kinds of problems. There's a new one by Stuart Ritchie called Science Fiction, which uh, which is really, really good. It's very entertaining. Uh, it's a bit lighter in tone than than Ben Goldegger's book. And um, yeah, it's a very entertaining read, although you will end up much more cynical than you were when you started it. And as uh, Shelley said, I have a, a blog called The Wiring the Brain blog. If you want to look at some rants about various things, um, epigenetics being one of them, um, and claims of, of you know trauma being passed on and stuff like that. There's, there's a sort of some poster children for um, bad stats and bad practice within, within some of that. I don't mean to pick on that field, but it's just one that I, I happen to hear about a lot. Um, and yeah, I think I will leave it there and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I have to tell you, um, for the students on the call, uh, those of you that are in the training pipeline and haven't reached the end, uh, the last course of the CCSM pipeline is advanced CCSM with Dennis Barber and myself. And we have been like just giggling the whole time because imagine this talk as a full semester class. It was uncanny, literally this, like similar papers. It was just perfect. Uh, so this is the style of thing that we do as well and think carefully about. So I really wanna thank you, Kevin, for uh, sharing with us. Um, for now, let's take some questions. So please feel free, uh, we'll start with the students. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. And if you put something in the chat, we can also say that out loud. So- um, Did I stop sharing? Go for it. Sure, yeah, no problem. So again, students get to go first here. If you'd like to ask a question, please unmute yourself or post in the chat. Shelly, we do have a, our first question in the chat. Do you see it? Yeah, uh, so let's see. Thanks a lot for your inspiring talk. Could you tell a bit more about the limitations of studies showing evidence of epigenetic inheritance in humans? Okay, go on your rant. All right, I will. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen again because I actually have some, some slides at the end that are related to that, and they're um, yeah, they're they're interesting. In, they, they highlight a, an, an issue. So um, okay, epigenetics. Yeah, let me point. Let me just point out the microbiome and give that a smack while I'm in passing because I think um, the, the 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 sort of microbiome studies that relate to psychological things are just they're awful, frankly. 
Um, but they have yeah tons of small studies, huge numbers of parameters being looked at and so on. Um, okay, epigenetics. So I've written about this a lot, partly because um, I would be, so I wrote this book a few years ago called Innate, How the Wiring of Our Brain Shapes Who We Are. And it was about genetic effects and developmental effects on our personality and traits and so on. And I would often get this question afterwards, what about epigenetics? Uh, especially if I was giving public talks, it was a sort of weirdly vague, just sort of left hanging there in the air, like, okay, well, what about epigenetics? But people have this idea that, um, you know, epigenetics sort of overrides the traits, the, the, the our, our genetic traits in some way. Um, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that epigenetics means many different things. Um, in developmental terms, it means just a cellular memory, a way of regulating gene expression that can be transmitted through cell division. But I think people have taken that as suggesting that maybe it's a basis for psychological memory and maybe memories of you know exposure, some experiences that we've had can be passed on and transmitted through meiosis, that is to the next generation. And I showed you an example of what that looks like in, in mice. So there are some, some famous um, studies that are really, really well known. And people refer to them as if they're incredibly robust. And they make their way into the public um, sphere as these, you know, um, quotes from, from articles in Discover and Time magazine talk about. It. One of them um, in particular is the Dutch winter study, but there's a couple of other studies looking at people who have been exposed their their grandparents were exposed to famine and then they um they test the the grandkids for various things lots of things okay let me show you um so they have all these sort of typical problems small samples no defined hypotheses huge number of variables lots and lots of covariates um no correction for multiple tests and publication bias so the absolute recipe for generating spurious findings this is a, one of these famous ones. I mean, these papers have hundreds and hundreds, or if not thousands, of, of citations. Um, this is about the Dutch famine. They were looking at it in the offspring, pretty small cohort for this kind of thing, um, the, 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 the offspring or the grandchildren of uh, people who had ex been exposed to this famine during uh, World War II when Holland was cut off by the Nazis and the, you know, loads of people were starving um, versus people who weren't exposed to that. And let me show you the data here. So what they what they claim is that there was an effect on um, birth size, birth weight um, of the offspring, the, the F2 generation. And um, so here's the data. It looks like a lot here, right? So they measured a bunch of things, right? Different aspects of birth weight. Um, these are the um, exposed or unexposed. There's another one over here looks also unexposed. These ones are the significantly different values. Okay, so 49.6 versus 50.5. So they don't look very significantly different, but they came out significant. Okay. Um, now these a lot of these other ones did not. They didn't come out uh insignificant in the offspring of the men. There was no good reason why that should be or not. It wasn't taken as a multiple test. Right. So really small kind of effect in a noisy, big, huge pool of things that didn't show an effect not corrected from multiple tests. So for me, there's no reason to think that that's a real thing, although this is one of the claims on which these, um, one of the studies on which these claims are, are based. And they're really sweeping claims. This is another one that I think was just amazing. So um, they were looking for changes in, in you know, the, the one generation and, and the grandchildren. Um, what were the effects on grandchildren? In this case, it was cardiovascular mortality. But there's been studies done on diabetes and schizophrenia risk and all, all sorts of things where there are claims published. Note the sample size here, 317 people in this case in Sweden. And what they found was that generally speaking, there was no response in cardiovascular mortality from in the grandchildren from the four grandparents. Okay, But then they sliced the data up uh, in many different ways by sex across the generations. And they did find one um, positive one where the paternal grandmother uh, had an effect on the son's daughters, but not the daughter's daughters or the daughter's sons or the son's sons. And they reported this as, as you know, real with uh, no correction for multiple tests. And you can imagine what the sample size was eventually when you slice it up at least eight ways, it could be 16 ways. Um, down here. Okay, so just silly, just silly stuff. But this is a really, really highly cited study. And all of the studies in humans are like that. Um, so, you know, you could say, oh, I just picked out the, the worst ones, but no, I didn't. Um, if you add in things like molecular 
things like genome-wide DNA methylation profiling. This is like doing a genome-wide association study. It should have samples of like 121,000 people, not 121 people. Uh, it's just <laughs> orders of magnitude more variables to look at than you have uh, people, basically. So yeah, not ex not surprising you get some molecular um, things that are that are there. Um, this particular blog is is all about that, and it's I let myself off the leash on that one, so <laughs> I apologize for full on sarcasm um, in that one. But yeah, I think that's everything I have to say about um, about the epigenetic stuff.